Phoenix. Come back home, come back home, come back home. No, Caroline said, her heart beating fast to the drum of the whispers that were filling every hidden corner of her tortured mind as she ran deeper into the forest. There were rumours about the dangers hidden within this place. A cursed place, a place of legends and myths. It was the very reason she had run in this direction, in the hopes that no one would follow, rather than heading for distant castles that she wasn't sure truly existed. Were the voices why everyone was afraid of coming here? You're immortal. You are chosen. Come back home. Immortal? Chosen? What did that mean? She could understand the call to go back home, but the other things? I'm not, she yelled. You have the wrong person. Leave me be. She felt as if she had been running for hours, although that couldn't be true. She fell to her knees, unable to move another step further. But the voices continued on. Immortal. Chosen. Home. She was only twenty years old. She was a nobody, somebody you'd never recognise in a crowd. Why were they saying this? Please, stop. She had been drained of all emotion by the time the distant words eventually began to fade. Gradually sucked away as if they had come from another dimension. Were they truly gone? Had she even really heard anything? Or was this all in her imagination? A sick joke she was playing on herself because of the inexplicable guilt she felt for doing what was right for her. She couldn't be sure of anything any more. But after a long period of silence, the anxiety Coraline had been feeling began to fade to a baseline rumble in the depths of her chest. The words still stuck in her head, though. They no longer had to be said out loud. She scanned the murky depths all around her. She had no fear of the dark of the forest, at least. That she would not turn away from. It was the darkness of others she wanted to banish. Was she truly free? All her life she'd been kept locked up in her own house, like some kind of caged monster, unless accompanied and shackled by fear. Everything she'd ever done had been carried out in accordance with strict rules, in the name of the father who despised her, and for whom nothing was off bounds. Her escape had been luck more than judgment, a spur of the moment dash for freedom. She almost couldn't believe she'd managed it. But she was here. There was no doubt about that. As her eyelids began to droop, her body desperate for respite from her tiredness, she realised this was probably the loneliest she'd ever felt in her whole life. Which was quite a revelation. She didn't even have the comfort of a worn-out straw bed to cling on to. And she had no idea where she was going next. But anything had to be better than where she'd come from. A place full of lies and deception. Coraline awoke with a start and screamed. Someone, with a strength it was difficult to imagine, had picked her up, holding her by the elbows alone, her feet dangling off the ground as they carried her through the trees dangerously fast. Because of how she was being held, it was impossible for her to turn her head to see, and she wasn't sure she'd want to. Then she would be able to see the face of her assailant. Instead, she tried to reason things out in her head. There was no obvious clank of armour, which would be almost impossible to achieve the speed they seemed to be moving, and no commander was shouting orders. The bells in the town were ringing out, but they were getting quieter. So, not someone from there? But who else could it be? There was an odd aroma, and a strange loping rhythm to the steps that propelled them along. The clip-clop of a horse? That didn't make sense. 
If this wasn't someone from the town, who else could it be? A slave trader? No, please don't be a slave trader. I don't want to be your slave, whoever you are. I've had enough of that. And whoever it was wouldn't want it either, not when that armour did come striding their way. Which it undoubtedly would. Because everyone in the town would eventually be out looking for her. Her father had powerful friends. Her disappearance would be the gossip to end all gossip. A plethora of never-ending chatter and speculation. Thankfully, there was a point when the movement stopped. Her body ached and her head thumped at her thoughts. She was placed on the ground, much more gently than she'd imagined would be the case. She immediately began to rub hard at her arms. She felt as if she had bruises on her elbows. Should she turn around? Should she look up? Would that be a bad thing? It had to be a bad thing. She waited quietly, the moments eternal. This didn't feel like the beginning of a brave new life. It felt like the end. The voice, when it finally came, was deep, likely male. Mamma mia, it mumbled. You're no supermodel, not in that get-up. The others aren't going to like that. The words spoken were odd, perhaps somewhat foreign. Still staring at the ground, she braved a few words of her own. A supermodel of what? The voice faltered as if it hadn't expected a response. Oh, well, of human existence, of course. That's what you all are here. What else? Human? You all? What else was there that could speak? Dread seeped up into her bones from the ground beneath her. She still didn't dare look. You know, they want you so much they put a price on your head. So I thought I wasn't doing anything today. I'd cross the breach and go and fetch myself a fledgling immortal and a big old pile of gold into the bargain. To be honest, I wasn't sure you were the right one. But my trusty old brain scanner said you were. Brain scanner? Wrong century. My trusty old senses, that's better. Anyway, that's why you're here. Now, with me. What have you got to say for yourself? Coraline gritted her teeth, unable to pass anything she'd just heard. I have nothing to say. Well, that's clearly not true, my dear. Because those things you just said, they was words. Without thinking, she did lift her head and saw... A beast? A man? Neither one nor the other. And were those wings? Or just very big shoulder blades? And she had no idea why the next thing she said came out of her mouth, but it did. Why did you carry me like that? I could have ridden on your back. The thing snorted, belying its equine traits. That prized position, my dear, is for those I love, not bounty. She spat back. You're just another monster. You know, I could be a monster, which you have no way of knowing. He made a clicking sound with his teeth and flicked his tail. Run, she thought. But her two legs couldn't beat four, not even on a good day. No, you couldn't beat me. She felt as if she were lacking air, as if the stuffing had been knocked out of her. The creature could read her thoughts, too. He was still staring at her. She squirmed. The words, my dear, are written on your face. He smiled in the way of someone who'd just thought of a private joke and wanted you to know about it. But, after a large sigh, he lowered his body to the ground and sat opposite her, arms folded, a look of resignation on his swarthy, bearded face. Look, I could be the monster of your nightmares, but I'm not. Those people in that town of yours are much more likely to do you harm than I am. Caroline frowned. But you said you were all out for the money. Huh, money. 
There's no more a pot of gold for retrieving you than there is a new weave for my tail that I haven't tried. I just thought you'd believe it more if I said, if I were threatening rather than trying to befriend you. See, I can see it on your face again. You doubt that I'm a friend, and I get that. Why would you trust me? You've not been treated well. You're scared. Most of the people you have known did not see the beauty in me. But I do, and I want you to see it too. To do that, you have to trust me. I will take you to where you need to be, to where things will be better. But you have to trust me, or this isn't going to work. Coraline picked at the phrase on her dress. The beauty of me. I'm not the beautiful. I'm just... Damn. I knew that supermodel comment would come back to bite me. There's more to beauty than just looks, you know. And yes, you might not be as beautiful as me. But you're not half bad. A bit more meat on your bones. A little less mud. A more stylish outfit. That beautiful copper hair gleaming in the sunshine. A smile on your face. Despite herself, Coraline's face cracked into a nascent grin. Not half bad. Is that a compliment? The creature winked. Well, I know you can't reach the heights that are my perfection, but... He held out a hand. Chiron, pleased to meet you, Coraline. I am officially your saviour and at your service, at least for the present. Now, can you please take this pack off my back for me? It twists my insides to oblivion every time I do it myself, and I'm really not getting any younger. After a moment's hesitation, Coraline pushed up to Neely, leaned over and undid the buckles on the leather bag that rested at the juncture between Chiron's two forms. He breathed out what she took to be a sigh of relief, as she lifted it and placed it in front of him. It felt pretty much empty. Thank you, my dear. Now, first off. He rummaged a little and then took out a jar with a green substance inside. He opened the lid. Let's get some of this on those bruises. The salve smelled like the best petrichor and felt like a velvet cushion as he spread the mixture across her elbows. Sorry about that. Didn't realise I'd been so rough, but I was in a hurry. You know they were almost upon you, sleeping like that on the ground. Have you never heard of climbing trees? Anyway, I had to act quickly, or getting you out would have been even more difficult. Hungry? Oh, not really. He grabbed a smaller bag from within the first and pulled out several other containers from that. Sorry, I don't believe you. You haven't eaten since yesterday morning, by my reckoning. Now, you're going to have to trust me on this. You won't have a clue what most of these things are, but, you know, we can. I do hate calling it time travel, but essentially that's what it is. When we're over the other side, we can exist in any and all times if we want, and we can benefit from everything that brings. I do so love hummus. I mean... Life isn't worth living if you don't choose the things that are important, right? Try anything and everything if you want. I have an endless supply. Coraline's jaw dropped at the spread before her. You do? Yes. She stared at the pack. And I'm guessing you're not going to tell me how. Nope. And that was it. No explanation, but plenty to eat. She dunked her finger into the hummus. Chiron raised an eyebrow and handed her a very elaborate-looking spoon. It didn't matter what the food was. There wasn't one thing that wasn't an explosion of joy on her tongue, and she had the luxury of being able to savour every moment. Far from not being hungry, she discovered she was ravenous. She was halfway through eating a bread roll with some unusual cheese that melted on her tongue, without actually being melted, when Chiron's body went rigid. A moment later, he'd gathered everything into the pack, including grabbing the food from her hand, and was back on his feet. 
We have to leave. On my back. Now. What? Your people. No. I mean, you said. Now. He gestured frantically. Even though she felt awkward about it, as if she were crossing some forbidden line of intimacy, Coraline scrambled onto Chiron's back. She didn't know if he was truly good or not, but she knew what was coming wasn't. It was worth the risk. Here, take this, he said. The pack almost knocked her off again as it moved with such speed and force as Chiron swung it around towards her. Without thinking, she grabbed at a clump of his luxurious hair to steady herself. Ow! That's not a mane, you know. I'm not a horse. Sorry. Just her for one, then. Arms round my waist. Even that felt unnervingly intimate. Perhaps this was why he didn't favour this method of transporting someone he didn't know well. She did it. She had to. If she didn't, she knew she'd end up with her nose crushed in the mud. You never said where we're going. Now, you ask? Later. Are you ready? And with no further preamble, Chiron's feet began to fly across the land faster than Coraline had ever imagined it was possible to move. The sound of hooves beating the ground. Pow, pow, pow. Like the rhythm of a song. Coraline had nearly fallen asleep by the moment the beat of steps jolted to an uncomfortable halt. Her body lurched forwards, but she managed to keep her balance. She rubbed at her eyes. The sky was dark again. They'd travelled a long way, but the land wasn't, not entirely. Before them, lit up by many torches, was an army of others. Not men, not women. Not those she'd been expecting. They were all like Chiron, and by the way they were standing, they didn't seem to be on friendly terms. She was sure she could hear some of them shouting her name, alongside Chiron's. What's happening? she whispered into Chiron's ear. True bounty hunters, he replied in kind. They would hold you for ransom given half a chance, and their threats would definitely be taken seriously. The first rank of their opponents lifted their bows high, and the sound of them knocking their arrows whispered their intentions. But Chiron didn't respond. That'll teach me to travel light, he said. You don't have a weapon. Not even my silver sword. Only myself. But I did get a little other help before I left. None of them have a pair of these. Lean back or you'll get whacked in the face. The studs she'd noticed before really were a pair of wings, and they unfolded from Chiron's back so fast that Coraline felt a breeze across her face. Helps to have a few friends over the other side, ones who can do the magics on you. It's a one-time deal, though. Single-use wings. Who would have thought that would become a thing? This is not the time to battle. This is the time to flee. You know you were holding on tight before. Well, if your arms aren't like a vice this time, this isn't going to go well. Coraline got the message loud and clear. Unfortunately, arrows could also fly, and as they lifted up from the ground, the air became flooded with a multitude of potential, whistling lethalities. We're going to die, she said. Don't think about it. Look on the bright side. Chiron took a sharp turn left. The bright side? But all their eyes are on me. You're going to have to teach me how to fight. Oh, I'm pretty sure you're wrong there. Their eyes are on me. I'm the only one they want to knock down. But if I'm going to die, I might as well die as a king of the skies as anywhere else. And as for the fighting, that is definitely not in your future. Chiron swerved as best he could, weaving back and forth. But it wasn't good enough. The odds were too great. Once one arrow had pierced a wing, it seemed that all the others found their target. 
trying to bring Chiron down was their game, and it was working. Perhaps not in spirit, but in body. I'm heading for the river, he cried out. Coraline could feel any remaining colour drain from her face. But I'm afraid of water. No choice. It'll give us a softer landing. We are going to fall, but the water will help break it a little. Whatever happens, you'll be all right. Me? But what about you? It felt as if Chiron shrugged his shoulders, but that would be impossible while flying, surely. Fear for nobody but yourself. You are everything. Before she could reason that out or deny it, they hit the water with a thud, and a huge wave accompanied the impact. Coraline couldn't hold on. She was thrown into the raging river, and before she knew it she was beneath the surface in dire need of air. She beat her arms in the water, trying to push against the flow, but it was impossible. She tried to grab onto anything with the tips of her fingers, but everything she touched was too slippery. She was on the point of giving up, her energy sapped completely, when four strong legs cocooned her between them, somewhat roughly. Without thinking, she grabbed for Chiron's tail, which dangled right above her head, pulled, and slowly surfaced above the water. She spat and coughed and spluttered, bits of mud and debris caught between her teeth. She gasped for breath, shaking from cold and shock. But she wasn't given a chance to dwell. Are you just going to stay like that? Chiron said, head turned back towards her. I mean, I know I have a great... I'm getting up. That was easier said than done. Her limbs felt like lead. Her head fuzzy with words that were not ready to come out. Eventually she managed to crawl over to the bank and flop down upon it which was no grassy paradise, but a mud pillow at best. The water might have washed the dust from her clothes, but that was a short-lived state of affairs. Chiron remained in the shallows. So, what's our plan B? she asked. I don't have a plan B. I only ever have a plan A, with an extra plus for originality. It's best not to think about failure, you know. Aim for the sky. I don't usually do that literally. But hey, sometimes things work out that way. Coraline frowned. And that helps us how? Well, don't tell me you don't have a plan of your own. I mean, you went out into the forest on your lonesome. You must have had a plan, no? Coraline crossed her arms. I don't know where we're going. You still didn't tell me. How could I possibly have a plan for that? Ah, yes. Well, in truth, my dear, I'm not really supposed to tell you anything. That's for them to do. You don't know? Of course. I know where. I know why, too. But some things cannot be put into words until the right moment. Do you understand? No, not really. None of this makes sense to me. Chiron shook his head and the movement rippled the length of his body. No matter. Where we're heading for, in literal terms, well, we have to scale that peak over there. I'm afraid you'll probably have to do that on your hands and knees, because the angle will be too great for sitting on the old comfy chair back there. At the top is... let's call it a portal. A portal? You mean a door? Not exactly. It's not like you can knock on it. An entrance, perhaps. An uneasy feeling clutched at Coraline's thoughts. And where does it lead? To your future, which I am absolutely not at liberty to talk about. Chiron looked left and right. Any idea what happened to my pack? Oh, Coraline glanced down at her lap, as if, somehow, the pack might miraculously still be sitting there, clutched tight by nothing at all. I think I... 
Well, some lucky soul will have food for life. I guess I'll just have to heal regular fashion. Can you pull these tatters off, please? The last thing I need is to have to be dealing with extra appendages flapping about. You mean the wings? But aren't they attached? Well, yes, of course. But they're not standard model. All you need to do is pull. They come off easy as... Look, my dear, we are fearless warriors. We do not shirk from a little pain, do we? We carry on. We rise above it. We get to where we need to be before the enemy finds us again. Because we don't want them stripping the clothes from our backs, do we? Coraline raised her eyebrows. Oh, yes, well, I guess it's kind of the same. But it has to be done. Come on, get on with it. She grabbed hold of the first wing, willing this to not turn out how she imagined, held on tight, turned her head away and pulled. A ripping sound, followed by a sickening squelch, made her gag. But Chiron didn't flinch. When she dared to look, she saw a crater of a wound in his flesh and an indescribable mess of feathers and tissues in her hand. Next one, time is capture. She edged round the other side of him. Your blood, it doesn't smell coppery. It smells divine, I know. Next one. Coraline repeated the process on the other wing, then stood there holding them both at arm's length. Now what? Well, they're organic. Let's feed them to the river. Something will have a feast. Oh, polluting the river with magic. Hmm. I'm sure it'll be fine. Chiron turned away, rolling his shoulders round and round. Wings disposed of, they walked side by side along the bank of the river towards the mountain Chiron had indicated. Even though he said nothing about it, it was clear he was in pain by the way he moved. Coraline felt the need to take his mind off of that, as all this was kind of her fault. So she tried probing again about what was ahead. But he was having none of it, and didn't seem to feel like talking at all. That meant she was left with her own thoughts. Chiron seemed to believe she was special in some way. She had never thought of herself as special. She had never even had a voice. She had always been quiet and on her best behaviour. She probably ought to ask him about the voices she'd heard in the forest, but she was too scared to. She preferred to concentrate on the here and the now. That was incredible enough. Somehow, she seemed to have stolen freedom for herself, with a little help from... What are you? Huh? You're not human, obviously. But what are you? Oh, I thought you... Centaur. Not your typical centaur, though. They're like, well, what you saw. Fighters. I don't like to fight. I like to heal. I've heard it said that they think I'm too eccentric to ever be accepted into the fold. Side note, I don't actually want to be accepted into the fold. That would be like saying I'm one of you. I agree with you and all of that nonsense. I don't agree. I hate what they do. That hit a nerve with Coraline. I've never felt like I belonged either. Not that I had a chance to. Having said that, though, that father of yours, I wouldn't be beyond doing something about... No, no, please don't. But he... Don't. It's over. At least, I think that's what this is, isn't it? You said you were saving me. Yes, in many ways. If we ever get up that mountain. Hop on, my dear. We need to step this up a bit. My senses are twitching, and that's never a good thing. The mountain stood ominously before them. 
To Coraline's eyes, it didn't look too bad of a climb, if she squinted to melt the edges of the image. She had never climbed a mountain before, and she was already tired from the amount of exercise she'd had in the past couple of days. Her body just wasn't used to it. How long will it take? she asked. Chiron rubbed at his chin, looked at her, rubbed at his chin again, straightened out his ruffled beard. A good day for someone used to it. So let's count on it being two. She didn't argue, but it did make her nervous about them getting caught. The more time they took, the more likely that would be. She glanced behind them. There was no sign of an army of centaurs kicking up dust with their hooves, but there was no guarantee that they wouldn't meet a sole tracker from the town, or even a hired mercenary, if news had travelled. Night fell again sooner than she'd imagined it would. She shivered against the frigid air. Chiron settled her down, snuggled against the trunk of a tree, with some bushes for cover where she would be less likely to be seen, and disappeared further into the mountain's forest in search of food. He came back with a large hare. She didn't ask how he'd caught it without a bow and arrow. It was probably best that she didn't know. But she did know everything about food preparation, and set about getting that done, using the sharpest sliver of stone she could find while Chiron started a small fire. We need to cook this as quickly as possible, he said. She nodded. Small pieces and lots of them, skewered on sturdy twigs, were balanced over the fire. The meal wasn't a patch on what Chiron had provided for them, but her stomach felt full at the end of it. That was all she could ask for. The next morning they were up before dawn and hauling the peak closer with every step. It struck her how fresh the aromas of the world were just before the light hit, as if every day really were a new beginning. Although that pleasure soon began to fade as soon as the heat set in. All day they trudged on uneven ground, scratching themselves on thorny tendrils that seemed to grab on like snakes. Luckily they hadn't seen any actual snakes, but there was still plenty of time for that. Another day ended and another bland meal was had. The next morning, just after the sun had peaked over the distant horizon, they reached the final stage of the climb, where the trees disappeared and only bare rock, partially covered in snow, remained. Coraline realised she was worrying at her lip. She tried to hide it, but eagle-eyed Chiron had seen. Remember, my dear, challenges are good. They build muscles up here. He pointed to his head, as well as in your limbs. The end is nigh. Oh, that didn't sound good. I don't mean, you know, I just mean the end of this journey is nigh. And your new future is about to be revealed. Time to reach for the heights. Coraline patted him on the back, being careful not to touch his wounds. I know what you meant. After several days of getting used to each other's foibles, she felt a strange kind of love for her travelling companion and his sometimes unusual way of expressing himself. The reality, though, was that her footwear was wholly inadequate, as was her clothing, for the rapidly decreasing temperature and the unforgiving terrain. She could have refused to go on, but she had nowhere else to be and no one else to look out for her. We're really close to the top now, Chiron said, chivying her along. Only another hour or two. Your new world's nearly here. We'll be there by midday, just in time for a fabulous lunch. I can almost smell the deliciousness from here. That didn't help. Her stomach began to rumble like her very own earthquake. And Chiron was wrong. That last section took as long as the rest of the mountain all told. It was closer to time for an evening meal, with nothing in between. When they finally got there, they stood side by side for a moment, which was difficult because it wasn't flat, and her shoes didn't have a lot of purchase. She felt as if she might fall at any second. 
Look around you, Coraline. He opened his arms out to what was before them. This is the last time you will know only what the human eye can see. Take it all in. Savour these last moments of this world that has not been drawn with a mere pencil, but fashioned with the paint of experience. The dance of life spread out for all to see. The strengths and weaknesses of the people lit from above. All this will set you in good stead for what is to come. A lump built in her throat as she did just that. I never asked. What is this mountain called? You don't know? Oh, dearie me. I should have. Well, it's Mount Parnassus, of course. Of course. If it had a significance, she knew nothing of it. It was too late to worry about such things. Instead, she looked out on the vastness before her and breathed in a deep breath of brisk air. She wondered at the beauty of the world she'd been living in, and wished it hadn't taken her till that point for her to realise it. And when she turned back, she saw the entrance, the portal. It definitely wasn't a door, as Chiron had said. It was more of a visible tear in the air that rippled with the breeze. That's where we're going? Oh, good, you can see it. I was getting a little worried there for a second. What? Well, we... I was pretty sure it was you, but the only way to be absolutely sure is if you can see it. If you can see beyond normal human sight. And you can. Um, yay. He waved his hands in the air in a strange gesture. Yay? That means good. In other dimension speak. All you have to do now is step across. Your destiny awaits. Step across? On what? On nothing more than what's here now. It's only another dimension. It's not like we're going to another planet. That's a whole other ball game of nonsense. Perhaps she hadn't quite gotten used to Chiron's way of speaking. That made no sense at all. She put a hand on his arm. You go first, please. But that's... I can't. Please. Chiron pouted. You promise me you're not going to run? I promise. Look, I'll hold on to your tail if that's all right. Chiron nodded. Do your worst. He winked at her as she reached out. Hold on tight now. Stumbling because Chiron had moved through the opening so fast she couldn't keep up would not have been her preferred option for being introduced to another dimension and those who lived there. But that was the reality of the situation. Her mouth gaped at her surroundings. On a stone platform hewn into the mountain, eight women stood before them. Some had arms crossed. Others looked at her with what she took to be disdain. Only one of them seemed to be in any way welcoming. Coraline looked down at herself. Perhaps that wasn't surprising. She looked nothing like them in her clothes of tatters and mud. Chiron bowed his head. This is Coraline, her earthly chosen name. Coraline, these are the other muses. Your sisters of musing, if you will, but not... Well... That's a whole complicated story. You'll remember it over time. A muse? What's that? I still don't understand why I'm here. The more amenable woman stepped forwards. You are not Coraline. You are Euterpe. Coraline glanced at Chiron, who gave her a small nod. I am Calliope. Every so often we all have to be reborn, because we get drained of all our inspiration and need a refresher. I think it's getting close to 1,000 times now for you. 
but we all always come back and try again. We need to truly experience the good and the bad to do what we do. Coraline realised her hand had gone to her midriff and quickly moved it away. Let's get you bathed and in some decent robes. I'm sure you left some here. I think they're in an old chest if the moths haven't got them. Chiron nudged Coraline as Calliope stepped away. Go on. I'm scared. Come with me. I cannot do that. It isn't my place. All will become clear over the coming days and nights. The magic will kiss you again, and you will pass that on to others when they ask for your love of words and music to bless them. Believe in yourself. This is what you are meant to be. He leaned over and pecked her gently on the cheek. But I don't want to lose you. We've only just... He put a finger gently to her lips. Remember, all you have to do is send me a message if you want me to get you anything special to eat. I can be like a meal delivery service if you want. Any day, any time. I... No tears. I absolutely refuse to accept tears, he said, wiping at his cheek. Now, go take what's yours. See, when I see you, my sweet, my friend. Coraline watched through blurry eyes as Chiron padded off down the mountain, which on this side of the portal had a beautifully fashioned path winding back and forth to the more gentle slopes. She remembered all the quite crazy things they'd done together in such a short time, even if it hadn't been by choice. And once he'd disappeared completely from view, she followed along after Calliope. She had a lot to learn, she understood that much, but she still didn't really understand anything else. It was the tenth night that Coraline had sat on the stone seat in her assigned crevice on the peak of Mount Parnassus. This was the place where everything was supposed to happen, the place where she would spend all of her time, once she had regained the gift. But she had felt nothing in all the time she had waited so far. She ought to feel miraculous. Instead, she felt ridiculous. She knew nothing about music and poetry, nothing at all. She had to be the wrong person. And yet she'd seen the portal. If she could see that, it had to be true. But she was still Coraline, not Euterpe, in her head. She had been told that if she didn't believe in herself, then how could others believe in her? So she had said to herself over and over, let me believe this is real. But it was hard. It was a strange concept to her that others would believe in her. She had been told that she would hear the calls when they came, and there would be a lot of calls. But all she heard was the hum of the wind and birdsong. The musical inspiration for every single human being who lived on the earth. That seemed like an impossible task. There were so many people. She had been assured that not everyone asked, and it was not her place to force her thoughts upon them if they didn't wish it, even if they were struggling. But even so. Another thing that disturbed her was just how she was supposed to recognise when someone called, if it wasn't her name they used. Because that was the deal. Anyone on earth could use any name, and she was supposed to answer. Or no name at all. And was she supposed to write their songs, their musical stories for them? Was that it? Why would no one tell her? And did she never get to sleep? It didn't seem fair that she had to find all this out by herself. She was so frustrated. She leaned back against the rock and closed her eyes. Nothing here was black and white. There was every shade of nuance. And it was just so difficult. As dawn broke, though, something shifted. She gasped and grabbed onto the seat. 
It was as if her dimension, the other side, had dropped away, and she was back in the land where humans lived, the world she recognised but didn't, because there were so many outlines intermingling with each other. For a moment she thought she'd woken up from a dream, and perhaps she had, but not in the way of a good night's sleep. They began to filter through. She heard the voices all at once and yet strangely separate, understandable, some almost begging. They were all trying to look further ahead than what they could see. It was not a question of ability, more one of desire. So much desire for the gift of expression. That emotional wave made her breathless. A vast ocean of creative energy waiting to be tapped. It was as if she had entered the hearts of every person who had ever felt the need to put what they were feeling to music. But in that moment, one voice rose above the others. Marlena, he whispered. And she knew it was up to her to answer. There was no question in her mind. She felt nervous, unsteady, so, so, so unsure. She gripped harder to the seat. She closed her eyes and she could see his face. But what should she do next? Tentatively, she opened her mouth to speak, not knowing what might emerge, if anything and it was the most magical feeling she had ever experienced. Like a single thread of copper held them together, and the energy flowed between them. It was as if he were the very air she breathed, and her inherent love for words and music rained down in inspiration. Tears began to stream down her cheeks, as everything came back to her. She was Euterpe and Coraline was slipping away. She didn't want that to happen, but she knew it was inevitable. In the heat of the moment, she couldn't help herself. It wouldn't hurt, would it? She had a feeling she'd done it before. She whispered it so quietly that no one else could possibly hear. Immediately, the connection began to falter, and another call came her way. But she could have sworn she saw diaphanous wings begin to form on his back, as his burning inspiration began to soar. And that, on a breath of air, so clear and pure, he said the name, Coraline. Hi, I'm Juliet. I feel the creation of this story requires some explanation because it's a lot longer than the stories I usually document on YouTube. So let's start at the beginning. Two random facts first. One, in December 2020, I started learning Italian. Two, when I first came across Monoskin when they won the Eurovision Song Contest, based on Zitti e Buoni, I thought, I don't think their music's really for me. Fast forward to October last year when The Loneliest was released and YouTube pushed it and pushed it and battered me into submission until I watched it. And I thought, oh, not what I was expecting. From then on, YouTube served me up some of their Italian songs and I clicked. Torna Casa particularly struck me because the enunciation was so clear. So I looked up the lyrics and I saw a few English translations and it occurred to me that these were just the words, not a song, and some were very, let's say, Google-esque. In my madness, I thought, I'm going to try to translate it to English so it could be sung as a language learning exercise. Ha, crazy person. I have a video on that on my language channel if you're interested. And then I decided to translate another and another and another until the present day, when in some total I have six to varying degrees of what I deem to be some kind of success. You should be able to determine at least four of them by now.
especially as I've just given you one to be getting on with. So I was thinking about an idea for a brand new story for this channel, deciding where I could grab some prompts from, and staring at my YouTube homepage. It hit me. Song titles. I found the titles for 25 Moniskin songs to use as prompts pretty easily, which was a nice manageable number. Not the highest I've ever done, admittedly, but a solid base. Thinking I was just going to be using the titles, I wrote them down, set up my document, and something else happened as I started to write. I was adding references to things in the songs I knew, too, using them as prompts. Darn it. I couldn't do that just for six out of twenty-five. That would be odd. When I had the lyrics for all twenty-five, of course, another ten of them were in Italian. So I had to do a very rough translation of them to get phrases and ideas that I could grab. This project was definitely turning into something a lot bigger than I had expected. But I'd already committed myself to doing it, and I'm not one for backing down from a writing challenge I've set myself. When I write these kinds of stories from multiple prompts, I don't usually have any idea where they're going. I'm a discovery writer, not a planner. But the prep had taken so long that some things had become clear. I realised I was actually writing about the Coraline, rather than just using the name... Uh, what might have happened if she'd got out that door. Which made me very conscious of the fact that I wanted to be respectful to the story of the song. I hope I achieved that. I also knew how it was going to end, which meant I was delving into Greek mythology. A mythology I didn't know a lot about, or rather hadn't retained a lot about. And yes, I do know the connection, and there is an oblique nod to Icarus. Most of those references were researched on the fly, like finding out that most centaurs were marauding maniacs. That kind of limited me on names. And discovering when I looked for mountains, because I had to have a mountain to scale, that the muses lived on a mountain was a relief. Trouble is, which mountain changes depending on the version of the myths you refer to. So I just plumped for one and went with it. So a story with 25 song titles as prompts, and over 60 other prompts relating to things within the songs. Still not beating the highest number, but getting a lot closer. I did make an exact list of what I deliberately used, but I know for a fact that there are other things that could be included as well, that weren't exactly planned to be so. And there are repeats, which I didn't count. And there's at least one from each song, although some could have come from multiple songs. So that's how it came about. I hope this story makes you smile and maybe invokes some other emotion too. I have this creation of video which covers the crappy first draft if you're interested in that. Some passages have changed a lot, several times, and others are more recognisable. If nothing else, it proves I'm not chat GPT. And here's my language channel if that's your kind of thing. Until next time. <laughs>